It was Peter Miller's first winter as a jack, the slang you would use to refer to yourself if you were a lumberjack in those days. It's now January, 1890, and Peter Miller has tagged along with his brother James, a hard-drinking, rough-and-tumble lumberjack, both of them from their family farm just south of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Peter was quickly learning that he probably was not a lumberjack, very unlike his brother, them always being the ones to be out hard drinking, having more whiskey and gambling away their earnings, turning everything into a competition, even taking, a, taking an ax and trying to see if they could get it between their fingers without cutting one off. <laughs> Peter had even earned the nickname Little Petey from the other Jacks. Hey, Little Pete, you want a sip of my whiskey? I swear I didn't spit in it too much. No thanks, guys. I'm good. Why not just have a drink? You're not going to be in a church for another three or four months. God doesn't even remember who you are. No, thank you. The only rest Peter ever got was on Sundays. Their one day off, he'd spend the morning sharpening his gear, the saws and axes, and then go out walking in the woods where he could finally be alone. One day back in November, he stumbled across this cottage right by the river where there was an old, kind woman who lived alone. Her husband had been a lumberman's foreman and had died many years ago. She would always invite Peter in and say, Oh, Mr. Miller, you're just in time. My, my granddaughter brought some biscuits. Why don't you try one? She's the only one who still visits this old lady. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Mm. Mm. These are so much better than the grub we get down at camp. I'm happy to share this kindness with you. I'm sure someday you'll, you'll do the same for someone else. Well, Peter wasn't so sure. I mean, they were up every day before the sun, out, cutting down trees all day, dragging them to the river, coming home after dark, freezing and drenched with sweat, just in order to sit and eat a bowl of hot porridge and do it all over again. Peter would go to bed each night and lie there staring at the loner by the fire, a guy named Johnson. For some reason, the other guys left him alone and only picked on Petey. Pete would watch as Johnson would sit there whittling a bird by the fire. Peter and James were always assigned to work together. They'd be out there sawing. So, uh, what's the story on that Johnson guy? That creep? Ah, uh, he's a weirdo. Stay away from him. Why? What's the story there? Ah, uh, three years ago, down in Cadillac, he claims he saw this thing called the Dog Man. Whatever. What on earth is a dog man? Uh, it's like an eight foot tall, half dog, half man. It only comes out when the moon is full. And uh, Johnson and some other jacks claim to have seen one. He told you about this. No, he's never said anything to anybody about it. It was in the papers and his name was in it. Well, do the other guys say that it's true? Most of them are long gone, jumped off bridges, went missing, that sort of a thing. Hey, don't go near him, will ya? But Peter was fascinated. In fact, that very next day, he asked the foreman to be reassigned to Johnson. Finally, when dawn broke, Peter gained the courage. So, uh, tell me about the dog man. 
Johnson stopped and just went back to sawing. <laughs> no, I'm really serious. I really want to know. But Johnson just kept right on sawing. Hey, look, just answer me this one question. Is it true? Did you really see one? Yes. Do you think there are any around these parts? You said one question. I know, but I'm not like the other guys. I genuinely want to know. Please? I seen them tracks down there by the river. What do they look like? They're like a dog, but, you know, big enough to be a man. That next Sunday, Peter set out to look for dogman tracks. There had just been a fresh snow. So for a while, he followed a deer, and then he saw a spot where some porcupines had had some sort of brawl. And then he came across what clearly was that of a, a young human. Boy or girl, he could not say, but he followed those tracks until they intersected with what must surely have been a dog man. Peter ran along, sure that this human must be in some sort of danger. He was looking for signs of blood in the snow. And then, at a certain point, the dog man's tracks just sort of went off into the woods again. But the human's tracks continued. Peter followed those human tracks all the way to the old woman's cottage. Oh, Mr. Miller, won't you come in? You're in time to meet my granddaughter, Rose. She was a very pretty girl in a blue checkered dress, very expensive. There was a, a long crimson cape that hung next to the fireplace. Hello, I'm going to be 11 in two weeks. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. Um, did you come here all by yourself? Uh-huh, I always do. I'm very brave. Just like her grandmother. <laughs> well, it's just that I, I saw some, some footprints alongside yours in, in the woods just now. What are you implying, Mr. Miller? I don't mean any disrespect. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you were, in fact, alone this whole time or in any sort of danger. He's lying, Grandma. I don't like this man very much at all. I want him to leave. Mr. Miller, I think you'd better go. Again, I don't mean any disrespect. Get out of my house! Well, Peter was now really interested. Why was the girl lying about whatever had happened? It clearly had made her so upset. The only person who might be able to help was, of course, Johnson. Peter waited until everyone had gone to bed, and he got up and got down right near Johnson's bunk. Johnson, Johnson, wake up. Oh, go back to sleep, Miller. No, Johnson, I saw Dogman Prince in the woods just earlier today. What? Let me get my coat. So the two men went out by the light of the moon they followed the tracks to the same spot. The only problem was a thick thaw had set in and everything was starting to melt away and become indiscriminate. Okay, Johnson, look, here you can see where the dog man's prints intersected with the girls. I don't know what I'm looking at here. Those could be your footprints. 
I can't believe you dragged me all the way out here in the middle of the night to see garbage. I'm going to bed. Well, when they got back to the camp, James and the others were waiting for them. Well, 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 brother. I've been waiting all winter to teach you a lesson. Me and the boys, little Petey, it looks like you've been out walking in the woods by the moonlight with your boyfriend here. And it's time that you learn what a real lumberjack is like. Show him, Andrew. The only thing that Peter recalls is seeing a fist come right at his face. And the next thing that happened was that he woke up in a bed in the living room of the foreman, which doubled as an infirmary whenever there was a need. The foreman was standing over him saying, look here, Miller, you get out there and you work an honest day's work or I will send you back to Grand Rapids on your own dime. Now go! Peter tried to get out of bed uh, and could tell that he'd been badly injured in the ribs and he could tell he'd been hit many times in the face. Uh, all the other men had been assigned, so he just took a single ax and went on his way. He got out there and it caused him so much pain with every stroke. He tried not to black out. He looked up and in the distance he saw a flash of red. It was as if he had looked at the sun too long. But, but this was Michigan. No one had seen the sun in two weeks. He looked again and saw the red continuing to move along the horizon. He knew that it was Miss Rose. He put his axe back in his holder and wandered off after her as best as he could. He would have traveled faster if he'd been a man with one leg hopping. Uh, uh, but he finally got to the spot where her tracks led all the way to the old woman's house. Uh, he got there and knocked. Nothing. Nothing. There was no sound coming from inside the cottage. This time he got his ax ready and pounded on the door until he heard, Come in. Now that did not sound like the old woman's voice, but maybe if she was sick, it could be her. He pressed the door open and saw no sign of the girl only the old woman in bed. But something felt really wrong here. A thick, heavy smell of B.O. hung in the air. Um, ma'am, did Miss Rose pass this way? She left. Is there anything I can help you with at all? No. Are you sure you're feeling all right, ma'am? Actually, I'm hungry. Ah! And it was a dog man. Miller swiped at the creature, but missed. The creature lunged up trying to get out of bed, but it was so protruding and large in its stomach that it could not move very well. Peter took the ax and drove it directly into the creature's arm. It shrieked, ah, and lunged for Peter's arm. Ah! Peter pressed backwards the creature's head all the way into the pillow. 
he grabbed the axe and drove it right into its head. Its jaws loosened its grip from his arm. Ah! 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 He grabbed a tablecloth off the table and wrapped it around. Oh! Ah! There was no sign of the old woman or the girl anywhere, just the large protruding belly of the beast. Peter had to know for sure if they were in there. So he took the ax out of the head and lacerated a slit along the top of the dog man's belly. He pulled open the seam just enough to be able to see <laughs> the crimson red of Miss Rose's cape. <laughs> <laughs> if only I'd gotten here sooner. <laughs> but just then, the body started wiggling around and, and the, the, the crimson robe in the belly started moving. And, and he, he heard a voice calling from inside the beast, crying, Help me! He, he jumped up and, and started pulling at the girl's body and, and miraculously she was, she was all in, in one piece and, and he pulled her out slimy until yeah, they fell backwards onto the pine floor. You've got to help. Grandma's still in there. Is she still alive? I don't know, but you've got to help. And so they started pulling out the old woman, also completely intact, slimy onto the floor. Oh, Mr. Miller, I knew that you would one day repay the kindness. It turns out that the old woman had taken ill and so when she heard a knock at her own door hours before, she assumed it was Miss Rose, but when the door opened, it was the dog man, standing eight feet tall, speaking near perfect Queen's English. The dog man, after eating grandma, must have climbed into the bed and assumed the part, making it so easy for him to devour Miss Rose when she arrived. Well, the three of them decided that they would keep this story amongst themselves. They dragged the remains of the dog man out to the snowbank behind the cabin and sat down and shared one last meal. Thank you, Mr. Miller, for saving my life. I'm sorry that I lied to you about the tracks that I saw in the woods the other day. Yes, the secrets of a stranger are the wrong secrets to keep. Peter went back on his way, back to the camp where he was promptly fired by the foreman for having left the job, but he didn't mind at all. He went and rolled up his bedroll, gathered his belongings without so much as even looking at his brother. As he got outside the front gates, he heard a voice after him. Hey, Miller. It was Johnson. You saw one, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. No one's ever going to believe you. You know that, right? Yes, I do. I actually, um, I actually took one down. If you'd like to come and see it. He could tell that Johnson was genuinely interested, but finally just said, no, my story's enough. If you follow Michigan dog man lore, then you know the first recorded sighting of a dog man was in 1887. 
Some lumberjacks saw one near Cadillac. Johnson was one of them. The next reported sighting wasn't for another 10 years in 1897, which means that the events of 1890 with the dog man and Miss Rose and Grandma and Peter had gone unrecorded. They had done a good job of keeping this story away from the conspiracy theorists. Anybody who may have heard this story would just pass it off as merely a fairy tale.